mentioned to you one of the things that we do um, at the University of Munich is especially at my the department where I sit, we do value addition. What is value addition? In milk, those of you are familiar, randomly milk has about seven, maybe 87% water, 3.3 something uh, percent uh, proteins, fat could go up to 5%, you have about 1% of uh, minerals and, and other components. And you also have lots and lots and lots of minor components in milk. So now at the moment, we, we look at milk as a source of raw materials, not as a product that can be consumed like that. So classically here you want to make cheese or you want to make uh, ice cream. So you take it, make uh, skim milk and ice cream and then you can go make cream. So we go beyond uh, that with technologies that are, uh, we could roughly say value addition to milk. And this is called by some people white gold. And, and luckily I, I didn't finish, but I wanted to give you a presentation about New Zealand. Maybe on another day next year, if I come back again, um, God willing, we could talk about a small country called New Zealand of 4 million people exporting 25% of the world food additives derived from milk, which is contributing about, I think, 20% of the GDP of that country. The only unique economy which is growing in Africa. Kenyans are 40 million, 10 times that. Of course, the difference with Australia is that uh, with New Zealand is there is a, a daily uh, a cooperative society called Fonterra, which hasn't collapsed to like what happens sometimes. So we do value addition to milk, the white gold, and we look at new approaches. I don't know, uh, gentlemen at the back, are you seeing anything? Yes. Okay. Uh, please don't miss nothing. <laughs> New approaches in fractionation of milk proteins through membrane filtration and selective enzyme hypothesis. So this is where I come, and there is a reason why I chose selective, because it's very deliberate, I will show you why. Um, very briefly on milk, this is what you get from milk. So milk has about 80% caseins and 20% whey proteins. And most of the caseins are also now broken down into four. So you have alpha, uh, alpha S1 and alpha S2 casein, so there are actually two types here. And you have beta casein, which is a very hydrophobic protein. And then you have kappa casein, which is very important for cheese manufacture. You, know, you might know, when you want to make cheese, you introduce chemosine. This is broken down at, I still remember, was it uh, Mr. Muriro who told us cheese technology? And we had to cram this. Phenylalanine amino acid number 105, methionine number 106, by chemosynthesis. <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't do that in class. I just made it elaborate enough. And when you break down uh, kappa casein, you get one part, which is para kappa casein, amino acid number 1 to 105, and you get something which is very important, called the casein macropeptide, which is a glycosylated protein in kappa casein, mostly it has no uh, phosphorus and it contains, it's about only 4%. That's amino acid number 106 to 169. There are 169 amino acids in kappa casein. So mostly when you make cheese, if you introduce chemosine, all these caseins go to cheese. This is soluble. At the processes that you make cheese, this is soluble, so it goes with all this into whey. That golden yellow uh, gutter, it's not like garbage, it's now gold. So this is where the money is, the big deal. And beta-lactoglobulin is one of the major proteins now. It's not in mama's milk, so it causes lots of allergy in formula feed, from uh, formula food for babies. You also have lots of immunoglobulin, ceramagumin, proteospeptones, and some other minor pro uh, peptides. And here also, at the moment, we work with proteins that are called membrane, uh, milk fat globule membrane proteins. When you make a cream, the cream is always protected by oleocytes. So there's oil and then there's a membrane and you break it to release the, 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 the oil. This membrane is made of proteins that are glycosylated, huge in size and very important. I don't know who is microbiologist here. 
For example, it has been reported that a baby who is fed mama's milk has a higher load of bifidobacteria than a baby who is fed uh, formula uh, food. And the main reason is attributed to the presence of so many glycosylated proteins and glycosylated uh, compounds in mama's milk. Those are very important because here they resist the enzymes because of the glycosylation and they will be available down there for bifidobacteria fermentation. Okay, that is beside the point. If you take milk, you do centrifugation. You have cream and you have, I, uh, I mean, skim milk. Cream has milk fat, it has centrifugable fat. And then there is milk fat globule membrane proteins, like I told you. One of them is something called butyrophilin which I, I will try, um, I think, next year or so to begin digesting it with an enzyme because I want to see whether we can get bioactive peptides from them. And those bioactive peptides, by the way, can be converted into capsules and you can buy them on the counter as capsules extracted from milk, which are bioactive. So, from food to dry. <coughs> if you use chemosine with enzyme coagulation, Basically from skin milk you get caseins which are insoluble in cells and you get whey proteins which are soluble. So normally here you would get this as waste. Maybe now it doesn't matter. Excuse my indiscretion. Isoelectric coagulation you get in, uh, disintegrated casein cells and you also get soluble whey proteins. So these are some of the basic operations you can use to separate the two uh, proteins. If you use heat and isoelectric coagulation, that means you, you heat those proteins, those skin milk, at pH around 4.6 to 5.2, because that is the range of most of the proteins in milk for, for isoelectric precipitation. Then you have both casein and whey aggregates, and they are all insoluble, so you don't separate anything. However, if you do thermal coagulation, no adjustment to pH to around pi, you have casein micelles and whey protein aggregates, which are insoluble. So these are basically what you would call background knowledge, the information that we know about how these proteins in milk behave in skin milk under different treatments. But then, the question is, if you really want lots of whey proteins, if you want lots of casein in higher purity, what do you do? So, just a comparison here. Beta-lactoglobulin is a, is a protein in milk, like I told you. Alpha-lactalumin is the other. This is 123 amino acids, this is 162 amino acids. If you use a membrane of 0 0.1 to 0.2 micrometer diameter, that means the pore size, huh? only 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 nanomicrometer. Because the size range is between 3 to 5 nanometers for these two proteins, and this is the, what we call the light scattering uh, you know, measurement of beta globulin. If you do, then this is the size that you, you get. If you do it for casein cells, which are about 100 times bigger, or maybe 20 times bigger than... Uh, <coughs> that's 20, right? Sorry for the exaggeration. 20 times bigger than the, the bio, I mean, for lacto, uh, lactalumin and beta lactoglobulin. And you can see here, this range is really huge. Then you get casein cells. So, what happens? This is what we get when we do filtration there. The whey proteins is golden yellow, and this is actually the color that I like most. It's the color of soluble protein and peptides. And this would be the retentate. So, that would be the permeate. Permeate means what goes through, it is permeated. And yet, retentate, it's retained. So you get the cassette <coughs> cells are retained and the permeate goes through. Now, what is the implication here? It quite simply says if you have a skin milk product and you want to separate it into whey proteins and caseins, just get a membrane of 0 0.1 to 0.2 micrometer uh, range, and there you are. So let's go back to our protein briefly. Now, alpha lactalbumin, this is the molecular structure. Don't bother about it, I will not. Uh, give you an exam at the end of this. I hear you have exams already. The protein is acidic. It has a pi of around 4.6. 
and it binds and it is very sensitive to calcium. So where there is calcium, it is very stable. Where there is no calcium, it's unstable. So this is background information. We also know it is a very notorious protein because it's very compact and it has disulfide linkages. So this C and C, they mean sister and six on the amino acid sequence, which I will show you, which is linked to sister in number 120 and like that. There are four of them in um, alpha lactalbumin. And more critically, it has 123 amino acids. It is very, very stable, exceptionally stable at high pH in the presence of uh, cal I mean, calcium ions. If you lower the pH, you get something called a molten globule state, which is basically denatured. Now, this protein, I love this part. It is very resistant to trypsin. So that brings in the selectivity, selective hydrolysis. It's because of this property. Okay, on the other hand, it was blacked out for <coughs> years. This is beta lactoglobulin, a very unique protein. It has, it has lots of strands, and these are not very easy to hydrolyze. But it's very nice because although it's the main protein in, 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 in uh, bovine milk, some authors say it is in human milk, others say it's not. Well, let's say largely it's not there. So it's an allergen. <coughs> it causes allergy. Now what I do is I try to solve the problem of allergy by digestion. I introduce an enzyme, it breaks down the protein into small peptides, allergy is gone. At what level that allergy disappears? Vis-a-vis -vis development of bitterness. This is subject to research. Because there is, a, there is a, a, a crossover. So if you cut it to become so small, so small, it becomes bitter. If you cut it to become slightly huge because you want to avoid bitterness, they are still allergy. They cause allergy. So there is a transition point that we have to determine. So kinetics come in again. And this protein gels when you raise the temperature and the pH. And what is critical, it has only five cysteine uh, molecules. And two of them are cross-linked. Two of them are cross-linked. But there is one which is free. And that one which is free is a big problem. This is the one which causes aggregation when you do heat denaturing or beta lactoglobulin. This protein is resistant to pepsin. That's what I love about it. Because that gives me selectivity. Alright, just to save you lots of trouble, this is better than to blow in what you see. Yes. <laughs> These are amino acids of better than to blow in. What you see as black bars, these are the uh, cysteine cross linked with a cysteine, cysteine cross linked with a cysteine. And here there is an exclamation mark because there is a cysteine at position number 121 which is free. That's a big problem. It has 121 amino acids. Again, as I say, 